most important doctrines in the entire Bible that we need to learn is baptism. And many people have been baptized, but many churches don't understand what baptism is. Some churches sprinkle only with little water on the forehead, and therefore they consider their people baptized. Well, we want to look into scriptures, and we only want to go by what the Bible does say, nothing else, only what the Bible says. So in order to go back, Let's go back to the very beginning and understand what baptism is. Did it originate in the New Testament or did God baptize in the Old Testament? But maybe we've overlooked it and haven't understood what it really means. Genesis, the sixth chapter. Genesis chapter 6. Now, I'm going to read out of the New International Version today. It makes it a little more clearer. And I've checked all the scriptures to make sure that they are accurate. So Genesis chapter 6 and start with verse 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. So this shows the state of the world within the first couple of, well, 1,000, 1,500 years after God had created the heavens and the earth and he put man here in the Garden of Eden. It had become so evil that it was continuous thinking of evil. What can I think of next to be more evil than I was yesterday? That's basically what it amounted to. So every thought of everyone who lived was totally evil. Now, down in verse 11 and 12. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So there was a total corruption of everything on earth. There was nothing godly left in the earth. Then in verse 7 of Genesis the chapter, or 6 chapter. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I've made them. God was actually grieved because he made man and man had become so evil that there was nothing good. And yet God is perfect. He's without sin. And so this had to be a grievous situation. It says so. Then down in verse 17 of the same chapter, Genesis 6. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. This is God saying this. He's going to do it because he recognized something that was so terrible and so wrong was taking place that he wanted to destroy it before it got out of hand. Now, Why was God going to do this? Why would he kill an entire population of the earth? It's found in Romans 6, verse 23. And then we'll go right back to Genesis 6. I'll read it. For the wages of sin is death. The death penalty came upon the entirety of the population of the earth because it had become so engrossed in sin that God destroyed it. The wages of sin is death. But, What is sin? And that's the key. You have to know what sin is before you can determine whether you have committed sin and whether you need to repent. All right, in 1 John 3, verse 4, it states the following. 1 John 4, verse 3. 3 Or 3, verse 4. 1 John 3, verse 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Or in the King James Version, it says sin is the transgression of the law. So when you violate the law of God, the spiritual law of God, it becomes sin. Sin brings death, and that's what was occurring before the flood. The entirety of the population of the earth had become so evil, and only continually, they delved in sin continually, that God finally had to destroy them. But in James 2, verses 8 to 11, it also describes what sin is so that we'll know why God destroyed that pre-Noatian population. James 2, verse 8 to 11. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Verse 11. And he identifies what law he's talking about. For he who said, and this was Jesus Christ at Mount Sinai when he codified the law, he who said, do not commit adultery, also says, do not murder. It's the Ten Commandments. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. 
All it takes is breaking one of the Ten Commandments and we're lawbreakers, and that's why God had to destroy that pre-Noatian population because they'd become so evil they were breaking all of his holy, righteous, and spiritual laws, so he ultimately had to destroy that entire population. But then in Romans 5, in Romans 5, just to show you that the law was in effect, and this is the death penalty that was coming upon that civilization, Romans 5, verse 12 to 14. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and that was Adam in the Garden of Eden, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all have sinned. Verse 13, before the law was given, sin was in the world. So this clearly says that before Moses received the law at Mount Sinai from God, sin was in the world. But notice what it says now. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. If there is no law in existence back then, those people could not have been killed for sin. The law of God has always existed. The Ten Commandments. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even though the law of God had not been codified and written on paper. It had been given orally in the Garden of Eden to Moses when God commanded the man. Even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did. So we don't have to break the same commandment Adam did, but we're still convicted of sin if we break any of the commandments who was a pattern of the one to come. So Adam was put in the Garden of Eden who would be a pattern. He was the first man, physical, and the second man, Christ, was to become a quickening spirit. So just as Adam sinned and he died, Jesus Christ came, he died without sin so that we could live forever. Now, let's go back to Genesis, the sixth chapter, verse 8 and 9, and see what God is showing about baptism through this whole section. Verse 8 of Genesis 6. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now here was a whole population that was going to be destroyed because of sin, violation of God's law, which had not been codified yet, but had been given in oral form, and they orally passed it from one to the other. Now in verse 9, here's Noah who had found favor for a reason. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Now, why was he called a righteous man? What is righteousness? All right, we've seen that the whole world lay in corruption, and they sinned. They violated God's law. But here is a man who found favor with God because he was righteous. The Bible does tell what righteousness is very clearly. In Psalms 119, verse 172, it states very clearly what righteousness is, and so we can know why Noah was given mercy and why he was saved. Psalms 119, verse 172. And it reads like this. My tongue, may my tongue sing of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. The Ten Commandments of God that Jesus Christ gave at Mount Sinai to Moses and put them in written form for the first time so that they would never be lost again. And all of civilization could always know what the law of God was. So in Psalms 119, verse 172, it clearly points out why Noah found favor in God's eyes because he was keeping the commandments of God. But then I'm going to just mention a scripture. I won't turn to it. But in Amos 3, verse 3, it says that how can two walk together unless they be agreed? God's perfect. His spiritual law is there. Noah was keeping his law. That's why he was considered righteous. And so God and Noah walked together. And that's why God saved Noah. Okay, now in 2 Peter, I want to turn to that. 2 Peter 2, verse 5. 2 Peter 2 and verse 5. If he, this is talking about God, did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness. See, he preached the commandments of God and to keep his law, and that's why death did not pass upon him or the rest of that generation. Now, he wasn't perfect, but he was blameless in that he tried with all of his heart to obey God and to keep his law. And seven others were saved also. That was his family, and that's all that was saved in that particular time. Now, back to Genesis 6, verse 14 now to 16. This is God's instructions to Noah. 
So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and, and coat it with pitch inside and out so it wouldn't leak. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the work to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. This was the instructions. Noah, make an ark. But why? Why was he making an ark? Let's look in verse 22. Verse 22. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. See, the idea is, obey God with a blameless attitude. I want to do everything you say, Father, no matter what it is. I will obey. So now, in 2 Peter, and it tells the whole story that I've been leading up to, why all this took place. It's for you and I today to understand. 2 Peter chapter 3. Oh, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 20 and 21. There were wicked spirits, remember, in the past. They became demons and Satan, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Notice, in it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. Remember that. Noah and his family were saved through water. Now look at verse 21. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. New Testament Christians. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but notice why baptism has to take place. But the pledge of a good conscience toward God. That's the reason for baptism. And Noah and his family, eight people were saved through by water because... They were blameless. They had a pledge toward God that they would obey Him. They had a good conscience toward God. And that was done back then, and it's recorded in the New Testament Scriptures for us so that we'll know the reason for baptism and the reason water is called a saving agent in the Christian religion is because it shows that we have a good, a pledge of a good conscience, a pure, blameless attitude toward God, and we'll never deliberately sin again. But there is another example of baptism in the Old Testament. It was used in ancient Israel. Ancient Israel, when they came out of Egypt, was actually baptized in the Red Sea. We see in Numbers 33, verse 3, and it reads like this from the New International Version. The Israelites set out from Ramesses on the 15th day of the first month, the day after the Passover. They marched out boldly in full view of all the Egyptians. So here they were leaving Egypt, a type of sin, and God had already instructed them previously to take a lamb on the tenth day of the month and they were to hold that lamb and keep it and kill it in the evening in between the evening at the ending of the thirteenth and the beginning of the fourteenth and they were to kill that lamb at the beginning of the fourteenth yes even in the fourteenth over it was killed and the blood was placed on the door and on the lintel the side post all right, when they were under the blood and that death angel passed over, representing Satan who has the power over death, it didn't touch any of the Israelites because they were under the blood. And that pictures how New Testament Christians are to be under the blood of Jesus Christ and therefore eternal death will pass over us and it will have no effect on us. But now, notice, Egypt, Israel was leaving Egypt, which was bondage, just like we are in bondage to sin, all right, they left Egypt on the first day of unleavened bread. They went all the way through, and they went up into a mountain area. On one side, here's the Red Sea on the other side. And who was behind them? The Egyptian armies. They had no escape. They were as good as dead, just like you and I are as good as dead for all eternity unless we come under the blood. But now, let's go on with the story, and I'll finish what it all means. All right, so the Israelites set out from Ramesses on the 15th day of the first month. That is the first day of unleavened bread, the day after Passover. They marched out boldly in full view of all the Egyptians. And that's important because when we're released from sin, we're going to be bold in going to God. But now in Exodus chapter 14, and I'm getting excited about this because it has a lot of meaning to it. <laughs> Exodus chapter 14, verse 8 and 9. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. So when we come to understand the shed blood of Jesus Christ and how that, that shed blood is shed for us, 
and that we can be forgiven all of sins, then suddenly we become bold because the satanic world and the demons have no more power over us. And so here it is, these Israelites were going out of Egypt boldly because the Egyptians had no more power over them. Then in verse 9, the Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi-Hiraweth and opposite baal Zephon. Now, what did I say before? They'd come up, here was a mountain range on one side, here was the Red Sea on the other side, and then the Egyptian armies. They had no escape. Just like the New Testament Christian, once we've sinned and broken God's law one time, there is no escape. We're as good as dead. There is no turning back unless we go through the days of unleavened bread. What does that mean now? All right, we've already accepted the Passover. We realize, hey, I'm as good as dead. Therefore, I've got to come under this blood. So the seven days of unleavened bread where the Israelites were leaving Egypt and traveled to the Red Sea, that represents us recognizing sin in our life, repentance, which is one of the basic doctrines of the church. And then suddenly on that seventh day, of unleavened bread, the number seven, all the way through the Bible shows completion. Seven days, weeks. Seven days in a week. The seventh day is the thousand year millennial reign of Jesus Christ, completing God's plan of salvation. Also, then you have um, the seventh day of unleavened bread, picturing you've completely come out of sin. Totally. You've repented totally. And they went through the Red Sea. And let's see what happens. All right, Exodus 3, verse 10. I want to mention this first, though. Exodus 3, verse 10 it states very clearly that God is the one who called Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. It says, so now go, and this is God, or Jesus Christ, talking to Moses. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So they were going to do it. And in Acts 7, it verifies this. Acts 7, verse 35. Acts 7, verse 35. <clears throat> This is the same Moses whom they had rejected with the words, Who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. So Moses was sent to deliver Israel, and he did it. Then in verse 7, This is that Moses who told the Israelites, God will send you a prophet like me from your own people. Moses pointed the people to Jesus Christ. Look, I'm delivering you now, but Jesus Christ is going to be the ultimate deliverer. And He is from all of our sins. But now, Romans 3, Romans 3 will give us a little more understanding and then we'll go back to ancient Israel and see what they did because it pictures the exact plan of salvation that God's working out for us. Romans 3, verse 24 and 25. We're justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him, Jesus Christ, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. All right, now, the reason I read that is because in ancient Israel, God did not punish them for their sins. They were blinded. They had no opportunity to receive God's Holy Spirit and to live forever. It was strictly physical promises to a physical nation to show us how he deals with people and how that we cannot attain salvation on our own physical efforts. And that's why he did it. Now, back to Exodus chapter 14. And this gets exciting. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. All right, remember, the mountains are on one side, the Red Sea on the other side, and Pharaoh's armies who are armed to the teeth with arrows, bows and arrows, uh, catapults, which I'm sure would throw huge stones for long distances into the, you know, into the Israelite people <clears throat> and destroy many of them. They had swords, they had horses, and they outnumbered the Israelites because the Israelites, in reality, had no weaponry. So they were totally defenseless against this Egyptian army. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Verse 14 of Exodus 14. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And this is exactly what Jesus Christ does for us. 
We cannot receive salvation for ourselves. He is the one who died on that stake and had his broken body and his blood shed for us. He's the one that produces salvation for us. We can't do it on our own. But then, once we accept Jesus Christ and all of our past sins are forgiven, then we have repented and get in harmony with the right laws of God so we won't sin anymore. So that's the key. Don't sin anymore. Now drop down into verse 19 to 22. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them. Coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel, God is now beginning to make a difference. Because you see, Israel is trying to escape from bondage, from sin. And so God is recognizing their repentance and they're leaving sin or Egypt. So now God is going to start putting His hand in to deliver them completely. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. So there was a separation between the two camps. And in verse 21, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. So the great huge walls of water came up on both sides. Who knows? Maybe 20, 30 feet high on both sides. And here was a path because Israel left Egypt in rank, five abreast, just like an army, five people, shoulder to shoulder. And so they had room to walk through that Red Sea, five abreast. Then verse, um, the last sentence of verse 21, the waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry land with a wall of water on their right and a wall of water on their left. So they were totally delivered with this giant exodus through the sea. Now, Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 53. Psalm 78, verse 53 gives a little more understanding about that. <clears throat> 78 and 53. He guided them safely so they were unafraid. They were unafraid because God had already told them to stand still, I will save you. And we're going to see that it was by faith that it happened. That's why they weren't afraid. But the sea engulfed their enemies. Okay, now let's go back and see how that happened. All right, but first, Hebrews 11, verse 29. This is called the faith chapter. Hebrews 11, verse 29. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. Faith is what did it. By faith, Noah was moved to build the ark. He had confidence. God, I believe what you're going to say. Therefore, I'll do it. The people of Israel believed that God would save them. He said, just stand still. Be still. I will save you. And he did it. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Fantastic. This is our God. The Lord Jesus Christ, who was the God that led Israel. 1 Corinthians 10, 1-4 proves that. That rock that followed Israel was Christ before he came into human form to die for our sins. So in Exodus chapter 14 now, we'll continue in verse 27 and 28. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. Now notice what happened after this. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. Israel was totally, completely brought out of bondage. Totally. And when you and I go down into the watery grave of baptism, every sin that we've ever committed is left in that water. Not one sin can be brought up against us ever again. We're totally forgiven. That's how complete God's forgiveness is. The Egyptians who represented sin and bondage to the Israelites were totally destroyed and not one was left. And that's fantastic. That's God delivering you and me. In Romans 6, Romans 6, verse 6, in the New Testament or the newer writings, reads like this. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless. So when we go down into the watery grave of baptism, the sin that was in us and that had convicted us of death, eternal death, is now powerless. It has no power over us at all. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. 
Just like Israel is no longer slaves to the Egyptians, we are no longer slaves to sin, none whatsoever. And that is a fantastic thing that we need to understand. Then in chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Therefore, because we are no longer in slavery to sin, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is not, nobody needs to be on a guilt trip. Once you're baptized, not one sin you've ever committed is held against you. None whatsoever. And that is total deliverance. Now that's what God showed through Noah and through Israel concerning baptism. And they were a likeness showing what he's doing to us and for us as New Testament Christians who are going to be led of the Spirit of God. Now in Luke 1, Luke 1, God began to intervene and to bring his own son, Jesus Christ, into the world. But before he did that, he was to bring a man to lead the way for him. His name was called John the Baptist. So in Luke 1, verse 63, Now his son, Zechariah, or his father, rather, Zechariah, and mother Elizabeth, were waiting, and she was pregnant with this child, and Zechariah didn't believe when the vision came saying he was going to have a son, it would be so many months, and he said, well, okay, you won't speak again because of your unbelief until the child is born and then you'll name him John. So in verse 63, Zechariah asked for a writing tablet and to everyone's astonishment he wrote, his name is John. So here was John the Baptist coming on the scene. Then in verse 76, it says, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. All right, now this is Zechariah prophesying of Jesus Christ. For you will go on before the Lord, or John will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him. So John the Baptist was to come, and his job was to prepare the way for Jesus Christ who would bring salvation to the New Testament Christian. Now in Matthew 3, we see a little more of the same story. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea, and he was preaching repentance for the kingdom of heaven is near. And in verse 3 he says... This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. So John the Baptist was to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. Now in John, to complete the story of his coming on the scene to prepare the way for Christ, John 1, verse 33. John 1, verse 33. I would not have known him except the one who sent me to baptize with water told me. The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So John the Baptist said he would not have known for sure that it was the Christ. Jesus was the Christ unless God's Spirit came down in the form of a dove and lit on his shoulder. That was the sign and that he was to baptize with water. Water baptism. And it is essential for the New Testament Christian. Now, Luke 3. Luke 3. So we're going to see what John the Baptist preached leading up to Jesus Christ. Luke 3, verse 2 and 3. During the, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into all the country around Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So John was preaching repentance and baptism so that you could have the forgiveness of sins when Jesus Christ came on the scene, that true Lamb of God who would be crucified. So he was truly leading the way, preparing for Jesus Christ. Then in Matthew, Matthew chapter 21, Matthew chapter 21, verse 24 to 26, now, Jesus had just been confronted with some of the Sadducees, Pharisees, lawyers, some of the Sanhedrin, and they'd ask him a question, well, who gave you all this authority to come on the scene and to heal and to preach and so on? Who gave you this authority? Notice what Jesus said. I will ask you a question. If you answer me, I'll tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from men? He put them on the spot. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he'll say, well, why didn't you believe him? So why didn't you go and be baptized if it's from God? But if we say it's of men, 
were afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So the leaders were between a rock and a hard place. They couldn't give an answer, and they refused to answer. And Jesus said, well, I'm not going to tell you by what authority. But the point is, John was baptizing in water. That's the point for New Testament Christians to understand that he was baptizing in water. Now, Mark 1, Mark 1, verse 4 and 5. So John came baptizing in the desert region and and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins or forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And why were they baptizing in the Jordan River? Because there was a lot of water. Water baptism, the word baptizo means a total immersion, a burial so that you're completely covered with water because of what it represents, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Now, Matthew 3, verse 11. We're still talking a little about John the Baptist coming on the scene and baptizing, preparing people for the baptism which Jesus Christ would bring. So Matthew 3, verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance. This is John the Baptist. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That means water baptism, yes. And we're required to be water baptized, but we will also receive God's Holy Spirit. And that Spirit is what gives us the power over unclean spirits and over the demonic world. And we have that authority as New Testament Christians, and they can't bother us. And they're subject to us in the name of Jesus Christ. And so this is what Jesus Christ was coming on the scene to do, to baptize with the Holy Spirit, and with fire. And that baptism of fire will be at the end of the world. Anyone who is not baptized in water for the remission of sins and baptized with the Holy Spirit and receive God's Spirit, then they are not a Christian. Romans 8, verses 9 to 11, and then verse 14 shows if you don't have God's Spirit, you're not a Christian. Then those who, all the incorrigibly wicked, will be burned up in the baptism of fire. And that's 2 Peter 3, verse 10. At the end of the age, when God's whole plan is over, when he totally consumes this earth in fire, he'll burn up all the buildings, all physical human beings who are left will be just turned back to the ashes and the elements of the earth as if we never existed. And we, the saints, who are then spirit, will walk on the ashes of the incorrigibly wicked. Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, prove it. So we want to make sure we're baptized according to the scriptures, and not with fire, not with fire, because there's no return from that baptism. But we want the baptism of Jesus Christ, water baptism for the remission of sins, and then the Holy Spirit so that we can be New Testament Christians. But in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, on the day of Pentecost, they were baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 2. This was the origination of the New Testament church. Acts 2.38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that gift is a down payment of a spirit body, which we will have when Jesus Christ resurrects us. And if we have that spirit in us, we're as good as alive forevermore. Because it's the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the dead. And he's alive forevermore. Then in chapter 19, Acts 19. I want to show that if anybody was baptized into the baptism of John, it was required, once the New Testament church started, they had to be rebaptized, Because it was only looking forward to the forgiveness of sins after Jesus Christ came. So Acts chapter 19, verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So you can believe on the name of Jesus Christ, but not receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. But in verse 4, Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. 
And it was only looking forward to the true Passover lamb who would forgive our sins. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of Jesus, or the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. They were about 12 men in all. So God's Spirit came on them once they were baptized into the name of Jesus. And so that is the key, the name of Jesus Christ. But let's see now, is baptism a New Testament commandment that each of us should be obligated to perform? In 1 Peter 2, chapter 21, remember Jesus Christ was our Passover. And for anyone who hadn't heard the two tapes or didn't hear the sermons, there is two tapes, Christ our Passover, that you can order. And it'll explain Jesus Christ as the Passover lamb and what his death meant. But in 1 Peter 2, verse 21, it says, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So we, as New Testament Christians, are to follow what Jesus Christ tells us to do. It doesn't matter. He's bought us as our Passover. And his shed blood has bought us completely. We're not our own anymore. But whatever he says, we're to do it. So in Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, Let's look at the example of Jesus Christ. Was he baptized? Well, let's look and see and, and let the Bible speak for itself. Matthew 3, verse 14 to 16. But John tried to deter Jesus, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Verse 15, Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, so Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And that was the sign that John was to receive that this was truly the Son of God. And that was it. So Jesus, our Savior, was baptized. He set us the example that we should indeed be baptized in water completely. And we'll understand why in just a minute. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. Jesus said to them, and this is when he had already been crucified, he had already ascended to the Father, and now he was back and he appeared to them and he was giving that final commission before he ascended. And then the New Testament church was to be kicked off on the day of Pentecost. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the word is baptizo, total immersion. It's a burial in water. But whosoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, you have to understand grammatics. All right, whoever believes and is baptized, both of those are in that context. Then it says, but whosoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, the, you, the inference is who believe and is baptized. It requires both, see? The inference is, just like you say, let's go to the store. Well, who is, who are we talking to? You. I'm talking to you. The inference is you. Let's go to the store. See, and that's the way it is in grammatics. So he qualified it by saying, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe, and the inference is, and is baptized. Because if you believe, you're going to follow what the Scripture says. Then they won't be saved. So water baptism is a requirement for salvation. Matthew 28. Once again, it's the same example, only by a different author of the New Testament. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. So this is a New Testament commandment. Now in Acts 2.38, which we've already read, on the day of Pentecost, they were told to be baptized for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ and they received the Holy Spirit. Verse 41 showed that believers were indeed baptized. They were baptized in water. Now, Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. This is a, a history of the New Testament church, the book of Acts. So Acts chapter 8, verse 5. 
Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there, that Jesus, the Christ, had come. Then in verse 12, notice what happened. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, notice, remember, they believed. Now notice what happened. They were baptized, both men and women. So just like it said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth and the understanding is and is not baptized will be condemned. So both is required. Now let's look at Acts 10. This shows where the Gentile converts, the non-Jewish converts, were accepted for the first time as a New Testament Christian. In verse 22 of Acts 10, Peter was in a trance. The men replied, so these men had been given a vision, go find Simon Peter, he's at such and such a place. All right, and Peter was up and he was on the rooftop in a vision himself. And these men came and said to Peter, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to come to you, to his house, or told you, or said, told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. All right, so, now let's drop down a little bit and see what he had to say. Verse 43 through 48. So this is what Peter said to Cornelius. All the prophets testify about him, Jesus, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. This was a supernatural intervention. Normally, you're baptized first, then you receive the Holy Spirit. But this was a supernatural intervention to prove to these Jewish people that yes, Gentile converts were indeed accepted and there was to be no difference, but everyone is accepted of God. Verse 45, the circumcised or the Jews, Jewish believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. And they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They were baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them a few more days because they wanted to know more of how to serve God better. So we've seen that they were all baptized in water. In John 3, verse 23, it says that the John the Baptist baptized there because there was much water. There was much water so they could bury them. In Matthew 3, 16, John the Baptist was baptizing and Jesus Christ came there and was baptized and they went up out of the water. So they were down in the water. And then in Acts 8, verse 38, it states that Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water. And Philip baptized the eunuch, and he went on his way. Now, let's discuss for just a minute the real meaning of baptism for the New Testament Christian. The real meaning. We've seen the background. It's all through Scripture, even in the Old Testament, and it was a type in Noah's day. It was a type when Israel came out of, uh, out of Egypt and they were baptized in the Red Sea. The whole nation was baptized when they went through those huge pillars of water on each side. And so we've seen that John the Baptist came on the scene. He prepared the way for Christ. Christ himself was baptized. Now let's take a look at the real meaning. Acts 8. Not Acts, I'm sorry. Romans 8. Romans 8. This is one of the most critical scriptures in all the Bible. Romans, the 8th chapter. Verse 5. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. So all of us when we're born have what we call a carnal mind. It just means a natural mind. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So when we're born, we're physical, fleshly human beings. We're born with all the appetites of the flesh. That's what Romans 8 verse 5 says. Once we come into Jesus Christ through baptism, then suddenly God's Holy Spirit gives us a spiritual dimension. And now we're seeking those things that are spiritual, not the fleshly physical anymore. Verse 6, the mind of sinful man is death. Remember we read in Romans 6.23, the wages or the payment of sin is death. As long as we're still a normal, natural, carnal, physical human being who has never repented and been baptized and received God's Spirit, 
we're as good as dead because the natural mind just leads us into sin. We don't have the spiritual power to overcome sin, so death is waiting for us. But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. And that's what we need to remember. Verse 7, because the sinful mind is hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. The natural mind we're born with does not want to obey God. It wants to sin. It wants to gratify the flesh through sexual appetites, through other type of appetites. And they're listed in Galatians 5, verses 16 to 19. Verse 8, and this is a dramatic verse. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. They cannot do it because they're not subject to the law of God. Therefore, they continually sin. That's why God destroyed that pre noatian civilization because of continued evil and the breaking of God's law. Now, let's go back in the same chapter of Romans to verse 1. Therefore, because we have accepted Jesus Christ, God's Spirit is in our mind, therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No sin. You are not guilty anymore and no one is to try to lay a guilt trip on you if you've been baptized in water. Nothing you've done in the past has ever held against you. Jesus Christ will never bring it up to you again. It's forgiven. And I have personal friends who cannot understand that. But it's true. There is no condemnation. It's written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You do not need to have any guilt in your life about anything in the past. Now you could suffer still being suffering from some things you've done in the past, but just like a person who murders, they're convicted of murder and they're in prison, they can be converted to Christ. Christ won't hold that sin against them, but they still have to have the punishment placed upon them by civil authorities. And so sometimes we sin, Christ forgives. We should have no guilt about that, but we still have to come through with a punishment and because of the civil authorities. Okay, now, let's drop down into verse 9. You, New Testament Christians, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, it's just like a man and a woman. Sexual relations and that sperm pregnates the egg and there is new life. A new life is formed. So God's Holy Spirit comes into our mind and now a God life, a Son of God, is now begotten. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Either God's Holy Spirit is in our mind or we are not a Christian. That is the only way that a Christian can be judged. That's why we can't go out and say that someone else is not a Christian. If they profess Christ, we have to at least believe them, their profession. We'll let God be the judge as to whether God's Spirit is in their mind or not. That's why anyone that says to me, I am a Christian, fine, I, that's wonderful, that's great. And my only job is to show them more truth from Scripture as while I'm trying to show myself also. Correct them in their line of thinking. I cannot determine whether they have God's Spirit in their mind or not completely, except by the fruits of their life will show it over a period of time. But just like a child, when it's first born, can only crawl, but later as they grow, you see the fruits of their life. So when someone is first baptized into Jesus Christ, whether they've truly repented or not, none of us can truly tell. But only by the fruit of their life as they live will they start obeying God more and then we can determine whether they are a Christian by the conduct of their life, the fruit of God's Spirit in their life. Romans 6 verse 13. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin. Once we become a Christian, we are not any longer to participate in sin as instruments of wickedness. But rather, here's what we're to do. Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Jesus Christ died so that you and I would not have to die forever. Now, it is appointed unto everyone to die this physical life, but we will be resurrected from the dead. But the point is, we are now bought back from eternal death and we're given eternal life through Christ Jesus. If this is true, we should offer ourselves to God completely and quit conducting ourselves in our old fashion of sinful sinfulness. Now, back to Romans 8, verse 3. Romans 8, verse 3. 
for what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. All right, God's holy and righteous spiritual law, the Ten Commandments, could not be kept by physical, carnal, normal human beings because we do not have the capacity not to lust at least once in our lifetime. As a man, and there's a gorgeous lady out there in a bikini, you're going to have a thought. And if you're a woman and there's a man, you're going to have a thought now and then, at least once in your life, or you're going to at least bear false witness or lie once in your life. That's all it takes, one time. So we are the ones that could not keep the law. The law is holy and righteous. That's what God's standard is. But we couldn't meet it because we're weak in the flesh. But notice what he says. God, what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. So Christ became a sin offering, and so He condemned sin in sinful man. Because Christ died for us, now sin has no hold over us. His Holy Spirit in us, now that Spirit gives us the spiritual power to keep His spiritual law. And you can keep God's law if you have God's Holy Spirit. You're going to slip now and then, but you can always say, Father, forgive me in the name of Jesus, and it's forgiven. And still, you're under no condemnation. And every one of us should be so happy. And I was kind of glad when we started service. Everybody was so happy and instead of real staid and tight, you know. Because we are. There is no condemnation for us. We should be the happiest people on earth. Amen. That's right. And I agree with that because I understand baptism. And I've been released from sin, and sin has no hold on me. And I want to shout it from the rooftops. Or from the radio stations, anyway. <laughs> but anyway, let's go on. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 sheds just a little more light on it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the resurrection chapter. Verse 3 and 4 is all we'll look at at this time. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Now this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Corinthians. He says, this I'm passing on to you. And he had already said previously, I received this from Jesus Christ. This is of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, if he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, that means if Christ's Spirit is in us, we're going to be raised. And that's proven by Romans 8 verse 11. Romans 8, if Christ Jesus was raised from the dead that third day, then you and I, if we have that same spirit, will be resurrected from the dead. We're as good as alive forever right now. Romans 8, verse 11. <clears throat> and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. God's Holy Spirit in us has made this mortal body that dies as good as alive forever. Boy, that's fantastic. I want that. Colossians 2, verse 12. Colossians 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Colossians 2, verse 12. Another dynamite statement showing our hope. It was talking about Jesus Christ having been buried with Him in baptism. If you and I are buried with Christ in baptism and raised with Him through your faith, remember faith? Noah was moved by faith to build that ark and he was saved and that was like baptism. And then Israel went through the Red Sea by faith. And here we are, New Testament Christians, going down into that watery, watery grave of baptism and being raised up out of that water by faith. Raised with Him through your faith in the power of God who raised Him, Jesus, from the dead. So this is what baptism is beginning to picture. The resurrection from the dead of Jesus Christ. And when you and I go into that watery grave, we have no sins when we come out and we're resurrected as a brand new, totally new person. Romans 6. Romans 6. And we'll bring her to a close. Romans 6 verses 3 to 6. This will make it very clear. The Apostle Paul started out in verses 1 and 2 by saying, well, is, is the law sin or should we go on sinning that grace may increase? See, most churches today believe that once you're baptized, there's nothing else for you to do anymore. You're under grace. But no, that's not true. He says, 
Verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning or breaking God's Ten Commandments that grace may increase? By no means. No, don't do it. You have to keep God's law so you won't sin anymore. We died to sin. And how do you die to it? Through baptism. We're showing a good conscience toward God that we won't sin anymore. How can we live any longer in sin? Verse 3, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? What caused His death? Sin. Breaking God's law. When you and I sin, Christ had to die to take our place so that we don't have to die forever. So once we go down to the watery grave of baptism and we come up, we're never to break God's law again. And there's ten of those commandments. Verse 4, We were therefore or buried with Him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may ha live a new life. We're a new person, totally sinless. Verse 5, if we have been united with Him in His death, we will certainly also be united with Him in His resurrection. And that's why we come back out of that water. When we go in, we're buried. We're dead. Well, when we come up, we're resurrected just like we're going to be resurrected or like Christ was resurrected. Verse 6, For we know that our old self was crucified with Christ so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless. Sin has no hold over us. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. That is the real meaning of baptism. The picturing the death of Christ put in that tomb and then His coming out of that tomb with a new spirit body. And if Jesus Christ is living in you and me through baptism and His Holy Spirit, we will quit sinning, we'll repent, turn to God, and then we will be resurrected when Jesus Christ returns to this earth. The only other thing I want to mention in closing is that we should always be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It says that in John 3, 22, Jesus did baptize. John 4, verses 1 to 2, Jesus, His disciples baptized for them in His place. He didn't actually do it. In Acts 10, verse 48, He commanded people to be baptized, the apostle Peter, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always in the name of Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.17 states that we do all in the name of Christ because He was the one in Colossians 1, 15 to 18 that created everything. He made the first man and woman. He is the one who came and became our Passover lamb. He's resurrected and He's going to be the one to come back and He's going to save all mankind. So since He is the Savior, then we should be baptized and submit to His name in everything.